Hi, I'm Catherine Jean Lopez from the National Review Institute, and I'm here with Naomi Schaefer Riley, who's the author of the excellent new book, No Way to Treat a Child, How the Foster Care System, Family Courts, and Racial Activists Are Wrecking Young Lives. Naomi, this book is so um, important. And um, can you talk a little bit for anyone who doesn't know how you came to be writing about these child welfare issues, which frankly, I, I hate to say, aren't um, the, the typical conservative subject matter necessarily. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me, Catherine. Um, so the book actually grew out of a number of different areas of interest of mine. A few years ago, I actually wrote a book about American Indians. Um, and I traveled around the country visiting different reservations and in Indian territories. Um, and I ended up writing about some of their child welfare issues. Um, Native Americans have some of the worst child welfare outcomes, highest rates of child abuse and neglect and a very broken foster care system. Um, and when I came back from all that, I just started wondering kind of what about the rest of the system? How are we treating the other children um, in the system? Um, and I had a position for a while writing columns for the New York Post. So I started covering some of the um, high profile child fatalities that occurred in New York City. And again, really tried to kind of dig deep and understand um, how the system worked, what was going on here, why were so many mistakes it seems like being made. Um, and sort of that led me more into the field of child welfare. And, um, you know, on, on the conservative side, I really, I started asking people, you know, I, I understood, you know, kind of what the right had to offer in terms of education reform, in terms of um, criminal justice reform. Um, I actually asked people, you know, what is the broken windows theory of child welfare? Um, and I didn't get a lot of satisfactory responses. Um, a lot of times conservatives, you know, would say, well, you know, this is the breakdown of the American family. And, you know, what do you expect? Um, an answer that I think is totally true and also totally insufficient. Um, there are about 440,000 kids in foster care right now, and we cannot turn back their clocks and put their families back together. So um, I just started wondering, you know, what, what can we do um, to, to help fix this system? And that number is important because as, as some Christians point out, this is, this is tack we can tackle this problem if people actually paid attention, but, but it's the paying attention thing that is a real obstacle, isn't it? It is a big obstacle. I mean, you know, 440,000 kids is a lot of kids. About a quarter of those kids um, could be adopted. Um, their parental rights have been severed. Um, it's about 600,000 kids who go in and out of the system during the course of a typical year um, who, you know, who will spend some time removed from their families. But I think, you know, in a country with 300 million people with the kind of resources we have, um, it is possible to tackle this problem. You know, we're always going to have a foster care system. We're always going to have kids who need to be removed from their homes. There are always going to be parents who are unable or unwilling to take care of them, unfortunately. Um, but I think that there is a lot we could be doing better to help these kids. Um, and, and, you know, if more people paid attention to it um, and got involved, I'm convinced that the problem would be, you know, would, would be much improved. There's so many different issues to talk about. And your book just tells so many stories, gives so many examples, is really the fruit of a lot of travel, a lot of conversations, a lot of investigations. Um, one of the topics, there's a young boy who just turned one yesterday, who, who I know, who um, basically um, in the weeks after his birth last year, wound up in the hospital unresponsive because he was born with meth in the system and his parents were addicts and they couldn't get off. And um, so they wound up smothering him somehow and he wound up in the hospital. Thanks be to God, he wound up in the hospital and not dead. And he's now in the care of a wonderful foster couple who of course are going through the brutality of the system. It's obvious that the biological parents can't parent this child. And um, this is something you go into and it's going to be years before they actually are able to fully adopt him. Yeah. And um, talk a little bit about this drug problem at, in particular and the, the, um, the issue of parental rights, because of course we don't wanna be cruel and not give parents chances. On the other hand, and this is the core of your book, we don't pay attention to what's the best interest of the child. We care about the parents more and that that's, a key of, to one of the problems of the foster care system. 
Yeah, absolutely, Catherine. So I think, um, you know, we we talk a lot about the drug crisis in this country. You know, there was just news that 100,000 people died of overdoses uh, in the past year. Um, but we don't talk about how the drug crisis is driving the child welfare crisis. Um, and I think people fail to recognize just what a strong connection there is. Um, and sometimes, although it means may seem obvious, I think we need to talk about why it is that drug addiction actually gets in the way of parenting. Um, so, you know, the first problem obviously, you know, for, you know, is, is all the children that you see who've been born substance exposed. Um, that is a huge problem. Um, and those children often suffer, you know, severe medical consequences um, for what is happening in utero. Um, but then next, you know, what you find, sorry. Um, oh, no, it <laughs> brings back memories. But then next, what you find um, is that, as any parent of an infant knows, that infants demand round-the-clock attention. They need to be, you know, fed and changed and held and rocked. And, you know, if they have a fever or any other kind of medical problem, you know, a doctor is telling you, you know, to monitor their condition constantly. Um, and then you have child, you know, children who enter what, what I like to call the mobile but totally irrational stage. You know, they're trying to run into traffic. They're trying to swallow their siblings Legos. They're trying to touch a hot stove. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience that even the most sober parent can find the stage of childhood quite quite challenging. Um, so when you know a parent is inhibited from properly supervising, especially young children, um, by some form of addiction or sometimes a co-occurring mental illness, um, it can really be quite dangerous for children. Um, three quarters of the child fatalities in this country are due to neglect. Um, and a lot of people talk about how neglect must not be much of a big deal because you know, you're not actually beating the kid. Um, but frankly, neglect is really, I think, in many cases, just another word for substance abuse. Um, the people I talk to for my book, you know, experts would say probably over 80% of the cases in our child welfare system um, have substance abuse at their root. So it's not um, a problem we can ignore. And the, the child that you're talking about um, is, is it's quite a typical case. Um, and so what happens is, you know, this child is finally removed because it's deemed that the parents cannot properly take care of them. Um, and then we offer the parents some form of services. You know, in this case, it would probably be some kind of drug treatment program. And if you, you know, if you have friends or family members or anyone you know who's ever suffered from an addiction problem, you know how difficult it is to end that problem. Um, you know, it's not merely a matter of, you know, going to a treatment program and then for most people, magically, it's all over. Um, it is a real struggle. And sometimes, you know, it could take years. Um, and sometimes, it is never solved. Um, and so unfortunately, our child welfare system's attitude is, well, we'll just, you know, if we put the family into, you know, some 30 day treatment program, the child will, everything will be fine, the child will go back home, and we can sort of, you know, take this, this case off the books, as it were. Um, and that's typically not what happens. Um, it, you know, getting out, getting out from under addiction is a much longer and more difficult process. And it forces us to confront, I think, what is the probably the most difficult question on the front end of child welfare, which is how long should a child have to wait? Um, and I do talk in the book about how our child welfare system has really become oriented around the needs and desires of adults and not the best interests of children. Adults are seen often as the victims. Um, in many cases, they are victims of things. I mean, they're, they're victims of poverty, of discrimination. Um, they're victims of addiction and mental illness. And many of them have even spent time in the foster care system themselves. So I don't want to underestimate the extent to which they are in very difficult circumstances. And we should be doing everything we can as communities, um, you know, to try to help them. Um, but then the question is, how do you weigh that against the safety of the child? And I think, unfortunately, the safety of the child um, is being deprioritized in a lot of these instances. 
Um, one of the reasons for that is that, you know, adults, even inarticulate adults are very articulate compared to children. You know, they can describe to you, you know, um, what it is that their circumstances are. And so I think caseworkers and judges are inclined to sort of, um, you know, hear these stories and feel sorry for parents and say, okay, we'll just, we'll give you another chance. Um, but in the meantime, you know, a child's life is hanging in the balance. Um, they're, they're really being made to wait for months, years um, in New York state, you know, where, where I live, the average amount of time a child spends in foster care is 30 months. Um, and, you know, and across the country, you know, there's a significant chunk, you know, 15 or 20% of kids in the foster care system who are there for more than three years. Um, and so foster care then no longer is a temporary thing. It's sort of becoming this permanent um, holding place for children. Um, and I just, I think that we know so much about the importance of brain development when children are young, um, the importance that they have a secure attachment to an adult who can meet their physical and emotional needs, um, that pulling them in and out of biological homes, relative homes, um, you know, foster homes, uh, you know, for years at a time is so damaging. And you point out so many who wind up three years and more in the foster care system. How about the older kids who age out, who in many cases wind up in jail or on welfare, um, and sometimes purposely on, in jail, so they have somewhere to live and some stability. Yeah. I mean, you find a lot of kids, you know, even though a lot of states have now extended the amount of time that kids can receive um, support from the financial support from the foster care system, some states to the age of 23 even, um, the, a lot of kids want nothing to do with the system past a certain point. They will actually sever their relationship with the system, you know, at the age of 17, just so that they don't have to deal with a system that has treated them so badly. Um, and a lot of people now, I think, really talk so much about the problem of aging out. And it, it is a huge problem, um, you know, that these kids, you know, either don't find an adoptive home and are not reunified with their family and really have no, um, you know, tan you know, tangible connections uh, to family um, as they grow into adulthood. Um, and I, 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 I think a lot about the aging out problem and I, you know, there are organizations I've encountered and I talk about in the book that do great work in terms of trying to transition these young people into adulthood, but it's really hard. And, um, and it's a really hard problem to solve once kids get to that age. Um, they have already experienced so much trauma by that point that trying to divert them away from substance abuse or, um, you know, from prison or from being trafficked and all of these things, I think um, we really have to just understand that our child welfare problems need to be solved much earlier um, than the aging out issue. And they must be, you know, in, in America in 2021, there's no excuse that this goes on in our country. You talk a bit about the problem of uh, the child welfare establishment that is so intent on kinship care. Um, this again goes to the, the point you, you've talked about already about not having the child's best interest in mind. Do you see any hope for changing this? Um, I think it's a little, it's hard. I mean, so the child welfare system, um, you know, is, is run by individual states and counties. Um, they receive about half of the money for foster care from the federal government, but the federal government is not exercising much in the way of oversight. Um, they don't uh, ever want to be in the position of withholding money, foster care dollars from a state, um, if the state is not achieving certain, um, you know, getting to certain goalposts. Like for instance, you know, states are regularly ignoring the timelines that are set out in federal law in the Adoption Safe Families Act um, that say a child, you know, has to, can only be in foster care a certain number of months before the state is supposed to sever parental rights. States regularly flout this and they report data to the federal government that they are flouting it. I mean, the states know, um, the federal government knows, but they're not going to withhold that money in order to punish states because nobody wants to be seen as withholding money from foster kids. So, um, you know, there's a, there's some problems there. And um, I guess, you know, so the, one of the kind of reasons for what I think is the group think that goes on in the child welfare system is just 
partly the way we're training people for the foster care system, who training people who become um, case workers or, um, or family court lawyers and judges. Um, we're training them uh, you know, in our universities in the idea that the most important thing uh, is for a child is uh, cultural sensitivity, um, you know, uh, racial sensitivity, this idea that a child always belongs with someone who shares their skin color. Um, and, and so what you, what you have then is uh, kind of a whole country of people who have kind of lost sight of the purpose of child protective services as a safety mechanism, as kind of the emergency room of the system. Um, and then you also have group think that's coming out of the private sector from foundations like the Casey Family Programs, uh, you know, or, or the NE Casey Foundation. And they have, you know, offered money to a lot of states. They have partnered with a lot of states and they have brought with them and supported a certain kind of ideology uh, in their work. And the states are kind of so happy because child welfare is uh, often underfunded. Um, they're so happy to receive this money from private sources uh, that they're willing to go around along with a lot of this. Um, so to, to answer your question in particular about kinship care, um, you know, I think this is, you know, common sense for a lot of people in the same way that a policy of family preservation is common sense. Uh, a child belongs with their family, um, you know, and, and there's a kind of lack of understanding of what is going on in these particular families that would make them the exception to that rule in many cases. Um, but then kinship care, again, common sense. You know, if something happened to me, of course, I would want my sister or my mother, or, you know, aunt to take care of, uh, you know, help take care of my children. Um, and I think that most people sort of see the phrase kinship care and they assume that, you know, that's exactly what it means. Um, but there are a few differences when uh, kinship care is talked about in the context of the child welfare system. The first thing is that many of these kin, um, you know, were aware of problems with the children, um, but they waited to intervene until the government got involved. So that sort of puts them in a different category in some cases. Um, you know, they waited until the government says, now we're taking away these children. And then they sort of, you know, may have stepped up and said, oh, okay, well, now I'll take them in. Um, money is exchanged for kinship care, and that's not the case uh, for a lot of families that are just happen to be taking in their relatives' kids. Um, but I think the more important issue is, are these parents, um, these kinship care uh, arrangements, are they qualified um, to be caring for kids? Um, so the first question is, um, do these extended families suffer from some of the same kinds of dysfunction that the immediate family does? Um, you know, substance abuse, for instance, is something that sadly is often passed down from parent to child. Um, and, and, you know, and, and abuse is too, frankly, you know, a lot of, it, it's not uncommon to hear a case where someone who's, you know, abusing their child has themselves grown up in an abusive home. So does it make sense then to give the the child to the grandmother um, if that's where some of this dysfunction is also being exhibited. Um, we also do not, um, you know, have the same kind of standards for kinship care. We don't, in many cases, conduct background or safety checks on relatives the same way we do with non-relative foster care. Um, and I, I point people to the example of, um, of Hillbilly Elegy. Many of your uh, viewers may have watched uh, or watched the movie or read the book of uh, J.D. Vance, um, you know, who recounts the story of his mother's being abusive toward him. Um, his grandmother is kind of seen as a, a savior figure in that book. Um, and he, uh, you know, eventually goes on to great success, the Marines and Yale and his political career. Um, but, you know, I do ask readers to think, you know, is that grandmother, was she an appropriate placement? I mean, she was in an abusive marriage herself and at one point doused her husband in gasoline and lit him on fire. And, you know, I think a lot of us would wonder whether that is an appropriate placement for a child, whether we really think we can guarantee a child's safety, um, a reasonable degree of certainty about a child's safety in that situation. Um, so that's the, the second to last thing that, that worries me about kinship care. And finally, um, you know, a lot of states are now practicing what's called kinship diversion. Um, they're so intent on getting the numbers of kids in foster care to go down um, that they basically 
basically, you know, find out about a case of a child who is being abused or neglected, they substantiate that case. In other words, they find evidence that that's actually happening. And then they look around for relative to place that child with. Um, and New Jersey was engaged in this to a large extent in the last couple of years. Um, and then after that child is placed with that relative, they do not follow up. They do not go on to find out, you know, whether that child is safe in that new home um, and also how much contact that child continues to have with the relative who was abusing them in the first place. Um, so uh, there are a lot of aspects of kinship care, which I think seem quite reasonable and, um, you know, an, a good idea for us to use it. But I think the logic of the policy is being stretched to the breaking point. Mm -hmm. You talked earlier about, you made mention of racial ideology in, uh, in the foster care system. This, um, this is, again, an outgrowth of what you were talking about, the system seeing the parents as victimized, and, and then looking at foster parents, if they're not the same skin color, as trying to rob these children of, of their, um, their backgrounds, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I think the the um, kind of racial ideology is affecting the child welfare system at two points, like you said. So the first one is this question of um, when to remove children. And a lot of people are looking at the foster care numbers and they see uh, what they call disparate outcomes. Um, black children are much more likely to be investigated, to have their cases substantiated, um, and to be removed into the foster care system, sadly. Um, and many people point to that as evidence of racial bias, of structural racism that is in the system. Um, and so they say, well, you know, in order to fix that, we just need to ensure that we fix the bias and just take two, fewer black children um, out of their home. So um, I do think it's important to keep in mind other uh, kind of areas of disparate impact in, in the foster care and child welfare system. The first one is that black children are about twice as likely to suffer from maltreatment um, as their white peers. Um, and they're three times as likely to die from maltreatment as their white peers. Um, and so I think of the child welfare system and child protective services in particular as a way of helping families and helping children um, in these difficult situations um, and when their safety is at stake. And so we need to go to where we see the biggest challenges and the problems. And if more black children in danger, then we need to be devoting more of our resources to helping those children. I mean, this is the ultimate kind of question of, do you believe black lives matter? I mean, I think black children's lives matter enough that it doesn't, that, that we should be um, providing these services to those children to ensure their safety. Um, unfortunately, you know, you have people, um, I, you know, activist judges and caseworkers, um, you know, who are really just super reluctant to take any black child out of their home. Um, in the last few months in New York, we've had uh, three high profile child fatalities of black children and they were reported to um, the authorities multiple times uh, and we chose to leave them in those homes and you know the investigation is still underway it's not clear you know who made those decisions um, but I think the pressure uh, to both on the uh, policy level to try to fix these disparities and make our spreadsheets come out even as if that's the most important priority um, and on a personal level uh, that caseworkers don't want to be seen as racist. No one wants to be seen as racist. Um, that all that pressure is combining to leave black children in unsafe situations. The second area where you see racial, um, the racial ideology, I think, infecting the child welfare system um, is in the question of placements for foster care and adoption. Um, the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act, which was passed in the 1990s, um, says you can't discriminate. Um, this, you know, over the objections of the National Association of Black Social Workers, which to this day believes that white families are never an appropriate placement for black children and have likened it to slavery. Um, you know, the the law says, you know, we are supposed to find homes, safe, loving, permanent homes for all children, regardless of their skin color. And we're not supposed to be playing this skin matching game uh, that some of the courts seem to be playing. Um, but unfortunately, that law is regularly flouted. Um, and, you know, many foster parents have reported to me conversations that they have um, had 
both in open court and conversations that they have occurred kind of, you know, in whispered tones among caseworkers about, you know, whether they'll be able to properly care for a child's black hair or how much cultural sensitivity they'll exhibit. Um, and even adoption agencies are engaged in this too, uh, you know, really lecturing white parents about not, not only their white privilege, but how, um, you know, how they're doing grave harm to black children by actually adopting them. So I think that, you know, this really has the potential um, uh, to do severe damage to the cause of finding um, safe, loving, permanent homes for black children. When we talk about foster parents, um, you've written a lot about how cruel the system can be to them, not just on the race issue, um, really treating them as if they're some kind of enemy or just glorified babysitter, right? Um, when in fact, some of these foster families are really, you know, saving the lives of these children. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how we can fix that? Um, there's also the fact that you talk about in the book that foster parents who step up to the plate often decide this is too much, <laughs> um, primarily because of how difficult the system makes it for them. Yeah. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, should I do foster care? And, and the first, you know, kind of half joking question I ask them is, how would you feel about standing in line at the DMV every day? Um, because that's the kind of bureaucracy you're dealing with only, um, you know, it's not just that they're going to have a say over your, um, your registration and your license, they're going to have a say over almost every aspect of your life. Um, and so it's very, uh, just, in, in the kind of exit interviews that folks have done with foster parents, they find that, uh, first of all, about half of foster parents quit within the first year, uh, but also that they find is that the, the challenge, as much as, as challenging as fostering can be uh, because of a child's behavioral problems and previous traumas, um, the challenges that that poses to a marriage and biological children, uh, finances, um, what what foster parents really are driven crazy by is the system. Um, you know, caseworkers who are uh, you know dropping off kids without explaining even you know not that caseworkers know everything about a child. You know, sometimes they know nothing, but often they actually do have a history, and the child has been in the system before, um, and they don't reveal anything about a child's medical issues or a prior history of sexual abuse. Um, you know, just really important things for a parent to know. Um, but, you know, they often cite privacy issues as the reason not to tell foster parents. But of course, if you're going to be taking care of a child 24-7, you know, these are important pieces of information for you to have. Um, and then you find that the voices of foster parents, uh, you know, are not listened to um, in courtrooms, even though they, in most cases, have a right to speak uh, at any kind of permanency hearing. Judges will just dismiss them. You're only a foster parent. What do you know? I mean, even foster parents who've been caring for children for years, um, their voices are, are not heard, um, you know, in, in their talking to, you know, they're talking about, you know, how a child is behaving, how they're doing in school, conversations that they've had with medical professionals about the child. Like, they're not allowed to share uh, any of that in some, in some courtrooms. Um, so I just, I think, you know, the system can really beat you down. And unfortunately, what happens when we uh, make it much more difficult for um, kind of responsible people to do fostering is we, we get people we don't necessarily want to do fostering. This, the, um, the system becomes desperate uh, for foster parents and will we'll take people we don't really want to be in this uh, role. Um, I interviewed a, a man in New Orleans who told me his wife really wanted them to do foster care and he was kind of reluctant, which is um, not an uncommon dynamic. Um, and But he agreed to go to a recruitment session, um, kind of informational session for uh, the local Department of Children and Family Services. And he said, he left that meeting and said, you know, we have to foster so that the other people in the room do not. Uh, and he re reported talking to, you know, listening to people raise their hand and ask questions like, do I have to keep my foster children in the same part of my house as my other children? Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, and, and so again, you know, this is a problem that we can solve by, you know, thinking about the way we do recruitment and training and support of foster families. Um, but unless we, we do work to solve it, you know, you're, you're going to continue to hear about problematic foster families too. Mm -hmm. And of course there's the monetary element too. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, what you want, I think, um, are middle class families doing foster care. And I don't say that because I think poor parents are bad parents or that they're incapable of loving and caring for a child. Um, I just think that a child who's been through the kind of trauma that we are talking about, um, it's, it becomes much more difficult for them to live in a home where there is that kind of economic stress. You know, where, where is the next meal going to come from? Where is the next rent check going to come from? Um, and so, you know, ideally, I think you'd want these, you know, stable families who can take in children and who don't think about these small payments that we offer foster parents. And, and many of the foster parents I talk to, like, it, it doesn't matter. Some of them don't take the money or, you know, they just, you know, put it aside, you know, for the child to use later or something that it's, it's not really even a factor in their family budgets. Um, and, but, but sometimes you, you get people, you know, who are uh, willing to put up with this bureaucracy. Those are the people who just want to do it because, you know, they want the extra few hundred dollars in their bank account and, and it's kind of a vicious cycle. And just to underscore the point that you're not on a jihad against poor parents, you had a beautiful story about a child who was in a, um, a foster home, the Pendletons, um, and uh, was able to go back to the family. And the, the, uh, the foster mother makes the point that they're not Disney vacations, but there's love there and there's stability. And so it, when when the child can be with the family the biological family absolutely um even if they're not living in in um in the suburbs with their own room and and all the rest um but i mean a, a lot of people i think um you know think that foster foster care and the child welfare problems that we have in this country are problems of poverty. Um, you know, there's a book that just came out recently called Invisible Child, uh, which was by a New York Times reporter who tells the story of a, a family with, uh, you know, with eight kids and they're homeless and they have all these problems. And, and she just keeps returning over and over again to the idea that, you know, if this family had more money, um, then they wouldn't be in the situation if we gave them better housing vouchers or more food stamps or, um, you know, more childcare, all these things. Um, and it's, it's quite striking. At one point in the book, um, the mother actually inherits $50,000. Um, and it's it's gone quite quickly. Um, and one of the things that I think is is kind of inadvertently revealed by this reporter is the extent to which substance abuse and not poverty are the things that are driving the dysfunction in this family. And that is what they cannot get over um, because we do provide a lot of resources. You know, some people would say we should provide more resources to poor people. I, I think that's an argument we can have about, you know, sort of the size and scope of the safety net in this country. But there is no reason, you know, from a policy perspective or from a budgeting perspective that children in this family should not have enough food to eat um, or should be living in houses with not enough running water um, or, or a heat, heat turned off in the middle of winter, things like that. Those are actually signs that a parent is un unable or unwilling to ask for help, um, not that there's no help available. And, and I actually sort of get annoyed with people who talk about the problems of child welfare just in terms of poverty, because I think you're throwing a whole bunch of poor families under the bus. I mean, there are millions and millions of families in this country who are low income families who do a great job of raising their children and, and raising them to great success um, and, and have love in the home and want the best things for their children. Um, you know, and, and if they don't know what those things are, they go and find out what they are. Um, and so just sort of suggesting that these are problems um, you know, that, that every poor family has, I just, I think is really, uh, you know, a gross oversimplification of the problems here. We're talking about a very distinctive subset of families um, where, again, the, the, the adult is unwilling or unable to ask for help. Hmm. So um, can we talk a little bit about, you talk um, in your book a lot about the faith-based um, help that's out there and these are largely the people we want stepping up to the plate, right? Because they're motivated by something more than certainly a paycheck, right? Yeah. Um, or um, uh, more money in their bank account. Um, what are some of the bright lights in, in, um, in the faith-based realm? 
Yeah. Well, I, so I encourage people when they, they start reading the book, <laughs> the first half is very, 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 very depressing. I mean, a lot of the book is very depressing. Um, uh, I, I have complaints even from my husband about this, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I think for me, like the most um, inspiring and, uh, you know, kind of um, warming stories that I heard were those from um, faith-based communities and organizations that have really um, revolutionized the way we see adoption and foster care in this country. Um, you know, they they really uh, uh, you know figured out that one of the the major problems was recruitment. I mean, you know, I remember seeing those pictures on the nightly news of a kid, and you know, would say, "Hey, did, you know, anybody want this kid?" Um, and uh, you know, I think most people who have any kind of business experience would say like, this is not uh, such an efficient marketing technique. Um, and so instead what you have is, you know, pastors and religious leaders who go into their congregations and say, you know, these are the five kids in our zip code who need homes tonight. And that is a much more urgent directed message at people who are really um, kind of primed to hear it uh, and primed to do something about it. Uh, they also, I think really, um, you know, understood some of the problems with training for foster families. Like one of the reasons foster families also quit is because they're unprepared, they're ill-equipped. Um, they don't, um, you know, understand all of the things that are different about taking in a foster family, even a you know, family who's raised, you know, five children and they think, oh, I've seen it all and, and I'm totally prepared for this. And, you know, you're not. I mean, the, the, the kind of trauma that a child has experienced um, could mean a, a totally different kind of parenting for you. Um, and so what many of these organizations have done is they've really, they've said to a state, you know, look, um, we are going to include in our curriculum for foster parents everything that the state requires, you know, uh, you know, information about the, the laws, about how many fire extinguishers you need in your home, about, um, you know, contact with the child, about contact with the parents, all these things, which are important. Um, but we're also going to add things like uh, curriculum and trauma-informed care, uh, which is so important in order to give these families the tools they need to succeed as foster parents. Um, the final thing that I think these communities really hit on, and that is, you know, one of the most inspiring things to me, um, uh, organizations like Project 127, which I talked about in Colorado, um, they have figured out ways to support foster families. Uh, a lot of foster families in this country, I think, feel as if they're doing this work in a vacuum. Um, and nobody really understands what it means to be a foster parent, um, you know, the hardship that it entails, why a child is acting out, um, you know, in, in a, in a playground or in a neighborhood or in the middle of a church service. Um, and so Project 127 asks volunteer foster families to bring with them, you know, four of their friends uh, or relatives or neighbors who will support them in this journey and who will, uh, you know, volunteer to do very specific things like respite care for the kids or um, building furniture or just praying for the family and bringing them dinners and, um, uh, I think it's just, it's it's what it's done in these communities is it's opened up foster care. So it's not an all or nothing thing. You don't have to be a foster parent to support these children um, and these families. There's a whole lot of um, kind of ancillary activities that you could be doing. And, um, and I think that that is providing a way for um, many of these foster families to stay in this work for longer. That's such an important point you make that everybody has a role in this. Not everyone has to um, foster or adopt to, to play a role. And you mentioned how a foster care can be a strain on a marriage. You and I have both heard myriad stories of people who like friendships become distant because people just don't understand what you're doing, which again is why it's so important for, for faith-based communities to you know, know who the people in their church are who are fostering so that you can provide date nights and meals and, and whatever is needed. Yeah, there was a, I remember there's a woman I talked to who was fostering and she just talked about 
the relief that she felt um, when she brought her daughter to like the, she had a, a, you know, toddler and she brought her to the babysitting service at the church. Um, and uh, she was trying to explain, you know, look, sometimes my daughter might act out. She might try to hit her head on the wall, like whatever it is, just call me, um, you know, um, come get me out of the service and I'll come right back. And the woman who was in charge of the babysitting said, you know, I've got this. I, I've had a trauma baby too. And the foster mother just felt this like extraordinary sense of relief that somebody else understood her, that she didn't have to be embarrassed to be saying these things, um, that it wasn't her fault that the child was acting like this. And so people, you know, when I, when I travel around the country, people talk about foster friendly churches. Um, and they mean a lot of different things like that, you know, by that sometimes um, it means it's a multiracial church where they feel more comfortable um, because, you know, they might be adopting or fostering um, a child of another race. Um, but oftentimes it's just a kind of understanding um, that, you know, these these families and the, the work that they're doing is not it's not the subject of gossip. It's not like, a, oh, this is so interesting. Let me find out more like it's a it's a community of people who've all said, you know, I may not be doing foster care, but I want to learn more about it and I can support you in this. And these are people who are not going to be asking questions like, wait, which ones are your real kids? You know, yeah, um, yes. yes. such, exactly. such, yeah. Um, was not ill intent, but yeah, um, just because so many, I, I think foster care, like the military, so few people in the United States actually participate. And so yeah. That's a good comparison. I think that's right. I, I do think that there's not, if you don't have direct contact, um, it doesn't mean that you, you know, you're malicious or that you mean anything bad by it, but you don't have enough familiarity to understand what's going on. And I'm not, I don't want to discourage people from ever asking questions because I do think that, you know, that's the way people are going to get more involved. But I also think it's the responsibility of the leaders um, in the community to sort of try to open this door, uh, you know, and, and, you know, add this to the long list of great other kinds of work that that churches and synagogues and mosques already do. And the encouraging thing is there are networks like the Christian Alliance for Orphans, where if you're a pastor and you have no idea where to start, you can tap into these resources. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was at the, um, well, Catherine and I were both at the, the CAFO conference a few years ago, and it, there were thousands of people there, um, all with different kinds of organizations. You know, some of them were national, but most of them were kind of local organizations. And I I left there and I said, I felt like I was at a Silicon Valley conference um, because everyone there was so interested in innovating and iterating, um, you know, figuring out how they can improve on so-and-so's idea and bring it home to where they are. Yeah. And I think that there are a lot of people who are quite passionate about, you know, this sort of entrepreneurship that needs to go on in this field. Um, but there are, you know, national networks you can tap into of organizations. Um, you know, the, on the most basic level, you know, Care Portal is something that operates now in most of the states in the country. Um, and it's kind of a, an online, um, you know, database where uh, folks can, um, you know, child protective service work or child welfare agency workers can write in uh, needs that foster families have or even that biological families who are being reunified with their children have uh, needs for strollers or car seats, need for somebody to help them fix something or put together a bunk bed, um, you know, up to more, you know, needs like needs to be driven, you know, to a, a job interview or something like that. And, um, you know, people can, a community can sign up for Care Portal and then anyone who wants to be on that list, you know, for needs in the area can say, oh yes, I'll, I'll take that on. Um, and so I, I I think that there are just, uh, you know, again, all different levels of involvement that people can have. And these organizations can really provide you with a whole uh, kind of spectrum of ways to help. Um, one of the reasons I started uh, focusing on foster care and adoption so much is because like you, I started asking questions of a lot of my pro-life friends who I figured would have the answers. Um, you know, a couple wants to inquire, who do you send them to, um, or other deeper questions, and people just weren't thinking about it, and um, that's still still a problem. Um, as you point out in the book, evangelicals are, are 
was sort of on the cusp of being um, the most creative and involved, in part because unlike, say, the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church has huge bureaucracies, right? And so if you're an individual member of a parish, you assume somebody's taking care of all the problems, you know, an evangelical church. <laughs> you outsourced one, it. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. But if you're one evangelical church, like there's nobody to rely on. You got to look around and see what the problems in the community are, you know. And um, and so I think we have miles to, to go on, on that front. If um, you're talking to, I, there are a lot of audiences for this book, I imagine. Um, if you're talking to conservative policy people, what, what are your recommendations? What are your, your proposed priorities? Sure. Well, I think that um, conservatives have typically, policymakers anyway, have typically not been at the table for a lot of child welfare discussions. And one of the reasons for that is because they don't, they don't have the right responses. They feel like um, they're having a conversation with people who say the problem in the system is entirely the money. Um, and who wants to be on the other side of that conversation? Again, it comes back to, do you want to be the one saying, no, I don't think foster kids need more money? I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a fixed school conservative, but I have to say this is one area where I'm happy to throw more resources right. at the problem as long as they're used well. I mean, I think our family court system is completely overwhelmed and we need more judges and we need more staff in those courtrooms. Um, now, we should also be emphasizing, uh, you know, to judges that, the kids are on a timeline here and we're going to give you a lot more help. But in return, you know, you're going to get through these cases and make sure that kids are not languishing in foster care for endless numbers of years. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why conservatives haven't been at the table. And the other one, again, is this race issue. You know, nobody wants to be called a racist. And so if you say, well, the problem in the system is not that it's racist or that racial disparities are not really the heart of the issue here, um, you know, people point fingers and say, aha, you know, you, you just, you're trying to police only black families and you don't care about how they're the victims in the system. Um, and so I think, again, you know, um, the policymakers kind of run away and just say, I, I'd rather not be a part of this conversation at all. Um, so what I hope in the book is to kind of arm folks at the state level, um, you know, and the federal level with a, a good explanation of what, it, what the foster care system is, what's wrong with it, um, and what we can do to fix it. And two things that I think are so important to focus on right now, a lot of people ask me like, well, what new legislation would you propose? And I think, you know, there's definitely room for that. Um, but I would actually right now focus on enforcing two very important pieces of legislation that we've already passed and that were passed 25 years ago. Um, the Adoption Safe Families Act, which again puts these timelines on kids in foster care, but is regularly flouted in the courtrooms and states are acknowledging that they're not sticking to the timelines. And now you have folks in Congress who want to overturn the Adoption Safe Families Act and don't think there should be timelines at all. Um, so I think, you know, really trying to um, uh, somehow regain what was a bipartisan consensus in the 90s in Congress um, on issues of child welfare, that kids should not languish in care for a long time. Um, and the second piece of legislation, again, the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act, which bars discrimination in placement for foster care and adoption. There are people who are trying to overturn that too. Um, and I think, you know, we need to, again, sort of kind of harken back to a time when Republicans and Democrats came together and said, Black children need safe, permanent, loving homes too. And we're not going to let the racial ideologies of these activists sort of prevent that from happening. Um, and I think it's going to take a long time for us to get back to that level of consensus. But um, if the if the right is completely MIA on these issues, we're never going to get back there. Um, because I think, you know, there are sensible liberals too, but they have um, you know, they don't have partners, they don't have, they don't have cover, but they also don't have partners. Um, and so I think it's just, it's important to kind of, uh, you know, think back to how we achieve that consensus for these important pieces of legislation and how we can, um, you know, ensure that the federal government is enforcing them and that the states are really prioritizing them. I mean, uh, you know, governors who appoint heads of child welfare agencies and state legislators can really sort of say, look, we, you know, it's really important to our state that we stick to these timelines and that we're not discriminating based on race. And let's make that a priority. And I, I think one thing that conservatives could really do a better job of is tell the stories of uh, the, the 
the agencies that are doing the work, you know, what you're doing in, in the book and so much of your reporting is letting it be known what the resources are, how they work, you know, success stories that are not Pollyannish by any means, you know, we have to be honest about the trauma and the anguish that, that is all part of this process as well. Um, but when people don't know the stories, they, that yeah, they, they can't even conceive of, for instance, that, you know, we should have religious liberty protections to make sure that, say, yeah. Catholic social services in Philadelphia can, can do the adoption and foster care work. That became a Supreme Court issue, and now they're doing the work again, but after an completely unnecessary and cruel hiatus forced by the government. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, you, you have to understand kind of what's basically going on on the ground in order to understand all these ripple effects um, that are being created uh, by people who want to stand in the way of these of these agencies and these communities. Um, you know, and and I just, you know, our, we, we need foster parents. Like I, I really think, uh, you know, I take a let a thousand flowers bloom approach to foster care agency. You want, you want to open up a foster care agency that, you know, caters only to gay parents. I think you should do that. You want to have a foster care agency that's more for Catholics, do that. A foster care agency for Jews. I mean, I just think there's, there's so much room in this system for more people to be helping and participating. Um, and it seems to me just a waste to be spending all this time arguing over whether one agency is catering to everyone. Um, and it's really taking the focus away from the kids' best interests. I mean, um, you know, there's, there is really an argument that, um, you know, uh, nobody has a right to foster, but every child should have a right to a family. Right, right, a permanent family. Um, one, one of the other issues that comes up, I mean, it, it's all an extension of this I ideology versus looking at the faces of these children. You know, there's so much transgendered pressure now. And one of the most beautiful things I've experienced in the last couple of years is, is doing an event about um, a, uh, a documentary called, or a movie called The Ride. And it's about a child who was in foster care and then goes on to be this BMX bike star. And I, I talked to um, the man who w was that real child. And one of the things that he said is that um, as an adult, like he's been confused about his sexuality because he was abused as a child, <laughs> you know? And so, going again going back to just being honest like these children are suffering so much of course there's confusion so don't push an ideology on them you know let them be children um and and not and one of the things i think we need to be humble about is going to your point about letting all the flowers bloom we adults are not not going to solve all our dif differences in the, the time these children need us to. And so, yeah, we have to be able to work together. Um, and, and, um, yeah, and yeah, have, have the agency that, that caters to different communities. Yeah. No, and, and as far as, you know, the, the kid, understanding what the kids' needs are, I mean, I do think that one of the ways that um, uh, conservative and religious parents could be pushed out of foster care is by states who are saying, um, you know, parents have to support a child's gender identity or gender transitioning even. Um, and I think that that's sort of a backhanded way and not very subtle way of saying to conservative and religious parents, we're not interested in having you as foster parents. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do worry significantly about the question of um, you know, these, these parents who are um, being forced into this position and the kids um, who are being forced into this position, because I think that, you know, some of these kids have been abused, but also some of, some of them are very confused. Some of them have real mental illness issues. Right. I mean, serious mental illness issues. And the idea that we are going to jump immediately to sort of treating foster children um, for their gender identity issues um, uh, before we get to all their anxiety and depression and the trauma they've experienced. I just, I think that's um, a little crazy. And, and for those people out there who are, you know, concerned about the parents' rights, um, you know, the idea that your child would be removed temporarily from your custody by the government and what they're going to come back a different gender 
competitor from the one you know you you sent them into the system with, or they were removed into the system with. I mean, um, that to me, uh, you know, is a is a, an amazing violation um, of that constitutional bond between a parent and child. So, um, so I guess I would I would just say, you know, all of these other issues are are touching on the foster care issue, and people like to use child welfare to do some of their social engineering, and it can be quite dangerous. Right. Right. And so cruel to the children um, and, and, and to the adults who are trying to help them, too, and really have their best interests in mind. So to the people who um, at, do ask you, should I get into foster care um, after the DMV comment, what, what do, you, do you tell them? Where do you tell them to go? So, I mean, I definitely encourage people to, you know, look to their faith communities and see if um, those sorts of resources are available there. But even if you don't want to necessarily become a foster parent, there are ways to kind of get more involved in the system and learn more about it before you jump in with both feet. Um, one of the things that I, I suggest to people is um, the role of a CASA, the court appointed special advocate, um, you know, somebody who meets with the child a few hours a week, who's in the foster care system and represents their views to the judge. Um, and and I think those people, um, uh, you know, have a kind of dual role. One is obviously representing the best interest of the child, but I also think many of these courts are are so badly run. They're, you know, regularly people refer to them as kangaroo courts uh, when I'm talking to them. Um, and just to have a set of, of eyes um, on what's going on in a courtroom to get the idea that there is a responsible, educated system, a, a citizen who is present here for these proceedings, I think, you know, could really have an impact on, um, on how the proceedings Things go, um, and the sense that you know a judge and and the court staff really feel like no, somebody actually is paying attention to what's going on here, and and um, and and whether we're following the law. Um, so that's I think that's an important role for people to consider as well. And earlier, I did um, make a point about how the Catholic Church, in particular, has miles to go. But I do have to say, I was encouraged. The bishops had their their November meeting last week, and a lot of focus was on Joe Biden and and whether they would would tell him not to receive communion. But what I thought was the most important issue is they were talking about this Walking with Moms initiative. Uh, which is really challenging churches to look at what the needs are in their community when it comes to pregnant women and, and mothers, especially single mothers. Yeah. Um, but, but one of the points that Bishop Nauman made, who was in charge of the pro-life uh, committee for the last couple of years, is that these kids in the foster care system, this is a pro-life issue too. We cannot right. abandon these children. Right. And so I really do think it's this tremendous challenge that we need to be meeting at this point. Yeah, the, there's a, yeah, the connection there is really important. Absolutely. Um, so, so talk about some of your goals in this book beyond the policy um, prescriptions that you just mentioned. Um, I mean, you're, you're really educating people about something that's really undercovered. You made the point that there are so many um, awful stories of death and, and, um, and neglect, extreme neglect. Um, I hate that adoption foster care kind of only makes the news when that happens, when some kid dies, or when there's some religious liberty battle going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think this book is really for people who, um, you know, read some of, the, some of the headlines sometimes and don't understand kind of how the system works. Um, so, you know, even, you know, there are other headlines. So, for instance, in, um, in Texas in the last year, 400 different foster kids um, have had to sleep in offices. And so I think a lot of people read that headline and they wonder well, what what is going on here? Why are they in offices? You know. And so the book gets into not only the question of why we don't have enough foster families, but also the fact that we've passed legislation in this country that has taken away funding from group homes. So many of these kids are older. They have behavioral problems. They have mental health problems. And so it might not be that the best fit for them right now is going to be in a foster family, even if we actually devoted the resources we should to recruiting quality foster families. Um, but these kids are going to need a, a kind of setting where they can receive treatment for the problems that they're facing. Um, but unfortunately, you know, Congress decided that too many of these facilities were abusive. And so we should just cut off the funding for them or really significantly reduce it. 
Um, and there's this magical thinking that goes on in the world of child welfare where people just say, well, um, you know, we'll find some place for them or they'll just stay in their homes or just stay in the families. And there is no solution. Um, and so, you know, I, I was in Texas recently talking to the mother of someone who works for CPS. And she said her daughter now, um, you know, has to sleep in the office sometimes to supervise the kids who are there. Um, this is not a, this is not appropriate. And, you know, I want people to understand what is going on in their communities and what are the weird incentives, financial incentives, and, and what are the ideological pressures that are producing these terrible results. Um, so I, I really hope people kind of, um, you know, see this as a manual for understanding um, some what's going on behind the headlines. That office story is, is how um, Darcy Olson got involved in, in fostering herself. She wanted to mentor a, a teenager and the local rules didn't make that possible because of her, her living situation. But she was told that there was a baby down the, the uh, hallway who was going to be sleeping in an office. And yeah. that's how she got yeah. involved in foster care herself and starting Gen Justice, which yeah. is uh, does advocacy for these children. So your book, Naomi, No Way to Treat a Child, How the Foster Care System, Family Courts, and Racial Activists are Wrecking Young Lives is so critical. Thank you for writing it. And I do encourage people when you get the book, after you read the depressing intro, skip to chapter 10 about the faith-based <laughs> families. It, it, it will help you cope with the rest of the book. But I really do think it's our responsibility to read this book and to, as you say, take it as a handbook. There's so much in there. There's a role for everyone. Um, the con conservatives need to be in this space. Pro-lifers need to be in this space. It's absolutely our, um, our obligation. So thank you, Naomi, for making it possible to understand what the heck is going on and, um, and, and some ways that we can be a, a help on this crucial issue. Well, thank you for having me, Catherine, and thank you for all the work you do and, and all the help that you um, have, have, have offered me and, and, you know, just to spotlight this issue. It's been, um, it's been inspiring. Thank you. Well, your reporting is critical. So thank you so much. And thank you, everyone who is joining us. Please um, share, share this, this um, conversation, share a link to the book, um, uh, follow Naomi. You have, a, you have a, a website about the book. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. It's a no way to treat a child is the website. Yes. And it's not just a way to buy the book. It's, it's yes. got other videos resources. and yeah, yes. all sorts of great resources. Highly recommend. Thank, thank, thank you, you again um, on behalf of the National Review Institute. Um, thank you.